the fall of Roman Emperor Philip the Arab in 249 CE had plunged the empire into a series of inefficient reigns, paling in comparison to the halcyon days of luminaries like Augustus, Vespasian, and Trajan. As the once glorious empire crumbled under financial and military pressures, it was also under constant threat of insurgents along the Danube River and in the eastern provinces. However, 284 CE saw the rise of a new transformative ruler, Diocletian. The future emperor, born on December 22, 245 CE in the Balkan region of Dalmatia, came from modest beginnings. His military career was an echo of those before him, rising swiftly through the ranks after joining the Roman army. This eventually led to him becoming a part of an elite unit within the Illyrian forces. Diocletian's capabilities didn't go unnoticed, earning him a command position in the Mosin army, situated in a northern Balkan province near the Black Sea. In 283 CE, he even served as part of the imperial protectors Domesticus during Emperor Carus's expedition to Persia, and continued serving under Carus's son and successor, Numerian. Interestingly, Emperor Carus's death in 283 CE was a deviation from the pattern, having passed away due to natural causes, a rarity among emperors. Numerian's rule, however, was brief. While some degree of suspicion fell on Diocletian's involvement in his death in 284 CE, the brunt of the blame was shouldered by Numerian's father-in-law, Arius Aper, the commander of the Praetorian Guard. Seeking to exploit Numerian's incompetence, Aper intended to seize the throne for himself. However, this plan failed. Ensuring justice for the fallen emperor, Diocletian executed Aper publicly before his own soldiers. In November 284 CE, Diocletian was announced the new emperor. His journey to reign started as he sailed across the Bosphorus Strait into Europe. Here, he confronted and conquered Carinus, the co-emperor and brother of Numerian, at the monumental Battle of River Margus. Surprisingly, Carinus was supposedly assassinated by his own soldiers. This defeat was a timeless victory for Diocletian, allowing him to seize the power of the entire empire. From there, he adopted the grand name of Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletian. Realizing the humongous size of the Roman Empire, Diocletian understood that ruling such a vast territory single-handedly was unrealistic. Recognizing this issue, one of his initial acts as emperor was dividing the empire into two distinct sections. Since he had no successor, in November 285 CE, shortly after taking over the throne of the empire, he decided to delegate by appointing an Illyrian officer named Maximian as Caesar in the western part of his empire. Maximian, who was later promoted to the rank of Augustus, promptly adopted the name Marcus Aurelius Valerius. Diocletian, not really affectionate about Rome, chose to stay as the emperor of the eastern portion. Although Maximian was made co-emperor, Diocletian considered himself the senior emperor, maintaining the veto power over any of Maximian's decisions. This marked the replacement of Augustus's principate regime with the dominate. However, life in the empire didn't remain peaceful for Diocletian and Maximian. The Roman Empire continued to be plagued by earlier difficulties, reviving several issues they had hoped would be history. Similar to his predecessors, unrest in the provinces of Mosia and Pannonia by the Danube River proved to be a challenge. Diocletian then spent the next five years crusading around his empire, striving to keep peace and stability. His persistence and hard work earned him victory in 286 CE that didn't just offer long-awaited solitude, but also bestowed upon him the title of Germanicus Maximus. Diocletian exhibited analogous tactics in Persia by overcoming the Sarmatians in 289 CE and the Saracens in 292 CE. Just like Diocletian, Maximian faced similar predicaments in the West. An unfaithful officer, Carousius, who led the Roman North Sea Fleet, took over Britain and a portion of northern Gaul, declaring himself the emperor. His rank was earned after assisting Maximian in conquering the rebellious Pagodae in Gaul. However, 
When it was discovered that he was retaining a large share of the war treasures for personal gain, Maximian declared him an outlaw and issued a death sentence. Still, just like many self-proclaimed emperors, Carausius met his fate at the disposal of one of his own subordinates, his finance minister Alectus, in this case. The strategy to split the empire seemed effective. However, every emperor since Augustus had encountered the issue of succession, the next in line for the throne. Diocletian's answer to this age-old problem was the Tetrarchy, an arrangement that maintained the empire's current state with two emperors, while ensuring an orderly transition in case an emperor dies or steps down. This innovative suggestion involved two Augusti, Diocletian in the east and Maximian in the west, and the Caesar serving under each emperor. The Caesar could then succeed the Augustus in case of death or resignation. Each of the four rulers would govern their respective territories and maintain their own capital. Although the empire continued to be disconnected, each Caesar was accountable to both Augusti. To populate these new roles, Maximian adopted and inaugurated his praetorian commander, Constantius, as his Caesar. Constantius earned his reputation after spearheading several successful campaigns against Carausius. Diocletian appointed Galerius a man of proven merit under the administrations of Emperors Aurelian and Probus, as his Caesar. Despite this strategic move, it wasn't long before turmoil began brewing on the imperial front in Persia and North Africa. In Africa. Meanwhile in Persia, the throne was wrested away from client King Tiridates the Great in 296 CE. This led to an invading army marching towards the Syrian capital, Antioch. Galerius, in his ill-advised counter-attack, faced an embarrassing defeat at the hands of the Persians, much to the public disapproval of Diocletian. However, Calerius rallied and managed to defeat the Persians and their leader Narses in Mesopotamia, securing a favorable treaty in the process. In Egypt, a rebellion was led by Lucius Domitius Domitianus, who proclaimed himself as the emperor. His tenure ended abruptly with his death, potentially an assassination, in December of 297, paving the way for Aurelius. However, he too was defeated and killed by Diocletian in 298 CE in Alexandria. Victories in North Africa, in the West by Constantius, a resurgence of control over Britain, and successful campaigns by Galerius against the Carpi along the Danube, eventually restored peace across the empire. Enjoying a reprieve from conflict, Diocletian had the opportunity to focus his energies on domestic matters. While the Tetrarchy would remain his crowning achievement, he took on the task of restructuring the entire empire. This spanned from changes in taxation to provincial administration, an effort to minimize chances of rebellion. Doubling the provinces from 50 to 100, Diocletian further divided them into 12 dioceses, led by vicars who had no military oversight. Instead, this was relegated to military commanders. The organization of the military was restructured into fast-moving battle units. In contrast to predecessors, Emperor Diocletian broke away from the traditional patronage system, favoring appointments and promotions of capable and reliable individuals. However, as Imperial Rome's significance diminished and power spectrum leaned towards the east, Numerous Roman senators witnessed a great decrease in their administrative influence. The growing influence of Greece and its culture marked the decisive shift of the empire's focus to the east. Under Emperor Constantine, this shift accentuated when he transformed the Greek town of Byzantium into New Rome, a vibrant hub of culture and commerce. Surprisingly, neither Constantine nor Diocletian considered Rome as their capital. Diocletian only visited the Grand City once, just before his resignation. Despite authoring massive projects like the New Roman Baths completed in 305 CE, the largest in the Roman world at the time. Maximian showed preference for Mediolanum, whereas Diocletian considered wherever he resided as his capital, ultimately settling on Nicomedia. Financial management has perennially posed challenges to emperors and the need for additional funds to fuel the reorganization of provinces and an enlarged military necessitated a thorough examination of the previous tax system. 
Diocletian commissioned a new census to assess the empire's population, land ownership, and productivity. In an attempt to raise funds and curb inflation, he implemented a tax hike and overhauled the collection procedure. Obligations were set forcing individuals to continue in their family business irrespective of its profitability. To curb spiraling inflation, he implemented the Edict of Maximum Prices, a law that established the cost of goods, services and labour rates. Nonetheless, enforcing this statute was a significant challenge. Diocletian, amidst ongoing issues with financial and territorial security, was also burdened by the escalating influence of Christianity, a faith embraced by both the affluent and impoverished. Since Nero's reign, Christians were persisting as an affliction for Roman emperors. This dilemma progressively exacerbated as their populace grew. Diocletian aspired for stability, which entailed reverting to Rome's conventional deities, a goal obstructed by Christianity. Similar to the emperors before him, Christians posed a threat to the Pax Dirum or the peace of the gods. Additionally, from the time of Emperor Augustus, there had been the imperial cult, the emperor's deification, and Jews and Christians would not recognize any emperor as divine. Diocletian's self-perception further complicated things. He started to see himself as an incarnate deity, requiring individuals to kneel before him and venerate the edge of his garment. He adorned a gem-studded circlet and ruled from an opulent, elevated seat. In 297 CE, he compelled all military personnel and administrative officials to offer sacrifices to the gods. Those who refused were promptly dismissed. Then, in 303 CE, he mandated the demolition of all churches and Christian scriptures. Galerius strongly advocated for these decrees. Yet, even amidst this extensive persecution, Christians staunchly resisted the Roman deities. Prominent clergymen were detained and given the choice to either offer sacrifice or face death. A bishop in Nicomedia, who refused, was executed. Ultimately, any dissenting Christian was subjected to torture and death. Let's wind back the clock and dive into the pivotal year of 305 CE. This marked the end of a period of intense persecution. But let's set the stage before we get to that. Diocletian the ruler of Rome, was no stranger to illness. After visiting Rome just once, he fell seriously sick in 303 CE. This sickness would eventually lead him to step down from his powerful position just two years later in 305 CE. His next chapter? Retirement, but not as we know it. Diocletian retreated to his tremendous palace fortress in Spalatum, a fortress complete with colonnaded streets grand reception halls, a temple, a mausoleum, a bathhouse, and sprawling gardens. But Diocletian wasn't done with politics just yet. Maximian, his co-ruler, was also convinced by Diocletian to hand over his power, paving the way for Constantius and Valerius to rise and claim their spots as the new Augusti. The powerful positions of the new Caesars were passed on to Maximinus and Severus. The elderly ex-emperor Diocletian temporarily stepped out of retirement in 308 CE, but he ultimately returned to this stately solitude, cultivating cabbages in his palace up until his death in October of 311 CE. Regrettably, Diocletian's dream of a lasting tetrarchy fell apart. After enduring years of civil war, Constantine I, the son of Constantius, managed to reunify the empire following his victory at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 CE. Constantine not only governed from a city destined to carry his name, Constantinople, but he also made a choice that would have left Diocletian spinning in his grave. He'd embraced Christianity, recognizing its significance, and even converted to the faith himself. With the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 CE, the Eastern Empire, though it retained traces of old Rome, was rejuvenated and transformed into the Byzantine Empire. And that brings us to the end of today's journey. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you've enjoyed our delve into the life and rule of Emperor Diocletian, a leader whose effective, albeit controversial, 
tactics irrevocably shaped the course of the Roman Empire. If you found this interesting and want to learn more about fascinating historical figures or errors, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you're the first to know when new content drops. Leave me your thoughts in the comments section about today's topic, or let me know what you'd like to learn about next. Before I sign off, I want to remind you that history isn't just about the past. It's the key to understanding our present and shaping our future. So let's keep peeling away the layers of time together.